Okay, so good morning to everybody. Welcome to this webinar. Let me introduce you Dr. Sara Bridio. She was a former researcher at Politecnico di Milano, and now she's working as a researcher at the European Commission's General Research Center. And she's working on the use of computational modeling in the biomedical research and, and other applications. Sara is here because she's the winner of the WPHI Best Thesis uh, Award, and she will discuss about her PhD research on in silico fidelity and surrogate models of the thrombectomy procedure for acute ischemic stroke treatment. Sara will have the presentation of around 45 minutes, then we will have 15 minutes of questions. You can ask questions directly in the uh, chat box or in the question box, uh, or you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you. So, uh, Sara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for having me for this uh, webinar. It's really a pleasure to present you with my, uh, my PhD work. So I hope I'm sharing the screen right and you see properly. Otherwise, <laughs> let me know. So, uh, um, yes, as Anna said, the title of my thesis was in silico fidelity and surrogate models of the thrombectomy procedure. So the idea was to use in silico uh, modeling for uh, addressing a clinical problem, which is uh, the treatment for acute ischemic stroke. Uh, stroke is the second leading cause of death globally, and of these, uh, with millions, uh, around 12 million stroke cases per year, and of these, more 70% uh, of stroke types are ischemic, meaning that there is a mass called uh, blood clot, which blocks the cerebral artery and prevents the blood perfusion of downstream brain tissues and causing an area which is not um, with non nutrients, let's say, and uh, eventually there is a tissue death and severe uh, consequences for the patient, even death. Uh, so the key concept for treating acute uh, ischemic stroke is that time is brain. So the treatment must be administered in the first few hours from symptoms onset to hope to recover as much as possible the condition of the patient. Um, until recently, so uh, until uh, 2015, um, almost the only available treatment was a pharmacologic one called thrombolysis, which was the injection of um, a drug to try to dissolve uh, the thrombus. Um, however, uh, this treatment was proved not effective in case of large vessel occlusions, uh, and the large vessels are defined as, as you see here in the picture, the internal carotid artery, so the intracranial part of the carotid, and uh, the ramification in the uh, middle and anterior cerebral artery, which form the so-called T-junction that you see here in the picture. Uh, so, uh, in 2015, a new treatment uh, was proposed for uh, large, specifically for large vessel occlusions. Uh, this treatment is a mechanical type of treatment called endovascular thrombectomy or mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, in 2015, there was this important clinical trial called Mr. Clean that you will hear also later in the, in the presentation. And with this clinical trial, uh, it proved that this treatment was effective and safe for large vessel occlusion up to six hours after the symptoms. Uh, so, uh, endovascular thrombectomy is done uh, is a minimal invasive procedure where, uh, from the femoral usually or um, the brachial artery, uh, you enter with the, the <laughs> intervention is enters in uh, the patient circulation with the catheter, and inside the catheter, as you see in the picture, there is uh, this uh, metallic mesh called stent retriever, which is uh, crimped inside to go up to the uh, position in the cerebral artery where there is the occlusion. Here, uh, the uh, catheter is unsheathed, and uh, the, um, the stent, which is made of nitinol, self-expandable, recovers its original shape, so it enlarges and traps the thrombus, and then there is the retrieval phase, as you see here in the video, hopefully removing the occlusion. Uh, sometimes there is also some aspiration with some catheters, but uh, now I will talk about the procedure with a uh, stent retriever. Um, so this, uh, after this uh, clinical trial, this treatment became the gold standard for uh, this type of occlusions. Uh, however, uh, it's still it's not. Um, there, are still room, there is still room for improvement of the outcomes of this treatment because only in about 40% of cases there is a first pass recanalization, which means uh, which is very important because uh, the less passes you need to do, 
the quick, the fastest is the uh, operation and the restore of the blood flow for the patient. The main causes of failure are if the thrombus escapes, of course, from the central trigger and you cannot remove it, or if the thrombus fragments and causes this uh, small embolization in smaller vessels. Um, so these causes of failure are related to various uh, elements. For one of those, very important, is the thrombus type. Uh, the thrombus can be very different in different patients. It can be uh, what is called a white thrombus, mainly made of fibrin and platelets, which is usually very stiff, or uh, what is called a red, uh, red blood cell uh, rich thrombus, so made mainly of red blood cells, which is very soft and but also fragmentable, and of course, compositions in between. And from clinical and experimental studies, for example, it is seen that fibrin-rich clots are stiffer, they oppose more friction and are more difficult to retrieve, while red thrombi give more the problem of the embolization due to uh, its softer material and uh, that is more fragmentable. Of course, uh, an element that has an influence is the design of the central retriever. There are many and very different among them uh, currently in the market. So there is now a great interest in optimizing the procedure by um, designing new, uh, improving also the design of existing devices. Uh, for example, tailoring specific treatments for some specific subpopulation, for, for example, based on the type of thrombus, and also to allow for a better uh, preoperative planning to assist the neurointerventionalist uh, before doing the procedure. So the aim of my PhD thesis was to develop in silico models, so in silico tools, uh, for this uh, aiming at this improvement of the treatment. So uh, I developed in silico models of the thrombectomy procedure performed with central retriever. Um, so uh, the presentation uh, will be divided in these three uh, big topics. The first one uh, presenting the high fidelity model of the thrombectomy procedure. Then I will go into the use of high fidelity and surrogate models of the procedure for in silico stroke trials. And finally, I will present to you a surrogate thrombectomy model um, with the intent of supporting preoperative planning. So let's go with the first part. I will start with uh, by showing you how we uh, develop this high fidelity model and a validation with in vitro experiments. So uh, we started in a collaboration with uh, Serenovus, a company producing uh, scent retrievers uh, that had this uh, setup for uh, in vitro experiments of thrombectomy. As you see, there is a patient-like uh, silicon vessel composed of the internal carotid artery and the ramification in ACA and MCA. Uh, then uh, the uh, neurointerventionalist perform uh, the thrombectomy procedure in this model with three, the three of the most uh, mostly used devices, so the Envotrap by Serenovus, the Tribo XP from Stryker, and Solitaire by Medtronic. Uh, each device was used uh, twice with two types of occlusions, once with a red thrombus made of 45% of red blood cells and a white thrombus made 100% of fibrin and platelets, so a stiffer one. Here, uh, and also there is a, the system of catheters and that I was saying before. Here is a video, an example of one of the procedures that were, were performed by the nerve interventionist in, uh, for these experiments. So in total, we had six uh, in vitro experiments uh, that we wanted to reproduce in silico. So what we um, were given before uh, performing, reproducing the, the procedure was like a picture like this. So the position of the thrombus and of the stem uh, right after its deployment, right before the retrieval. And we, from this um, image, we tried to replicate in silico, and then we run the simulation, and only at the end we compare the results with the in vitro experiment. So here is how we built our in silico model. So we were given the CAD model used for 3D printing the silicon vessel. We used it to create the in silico model. And the vessel was discretized with quadrilateral rigid elements. Uh, then we also modeled, of course, the catheters, also discretized with rigid elements. And we uh, created a model of the thrombus, as I said, based on the pictures we were given uh, to have the right length and position. 
a few words on the modeling of the thrombus. The thrombi are um, discretized with tetrahedral elements, and the material model was, uh, was chosen a quasi-perelactic form formulation available in LSDINO, which is the software we used for the simulation. And the uh, material properties were calibra calibrated with uh, in vitro experiments on cloth analogs, uh, so of unconfined compression and tensile depth. As you see here in the graph, um, white thrombi are usually stiffer than uh, red thrombi, and this information, of course, is integrated in our uh, in our model. Uh, then uh, I went on, on modeling the stent retrievers. Uh, here you see uh, the the finite element models discretized with uh, beam elements. Um, and also here, the mechanical properties of the nitinol material was calibrated with the in vitro uh, uniaxial tensile uh, test on the real devices. So uh, here are the steps of the simulation that, as I said, was performed in LS Dino uh, of the thrombectomy. So first, there is the stent crimping inside the microcatheter. Then uh, there is the navigation of the stent, as you see inside the, red, the green uh, catheter, to reach the, uh, the occlusion position. And this was done based on the picture that was uh, given to us. Then the stent is deployed by progressively removing the contacts with the, uh, with the catheter to simulate the unsheathing of the catheter. So at this point, the stent entraps the thrombus, and finally there is the retrieval. And we move the tip of the stent retriever along this, uh, the center line of the catheter, imagining a positioning of the, of the catheter inside the vessel. Uh, so just to give an idea, this simulation uh, was run on 28 CPUs with uh, 250 uh, gigabytes of RAM and lasted between 46 and 58 hours, depending on the experiment to reproduce. So this was the result of our study. Um, our goal, of course, was to replicate the uh, outcome of the in vitro experiment, so to have a success uh, if <laughs> also in vitro there was a success or a failure uh, in the other case. So as you see, we had uh, we succeeded in five out of six cases. Only in one, we had a successful outcome in silico and it was a failure in vitro. Uh, so let me show you first the cases where we were able to reproduce the outcome. So this is the case with the embo trap device and the fragmentable red thrombus. As you see, we were uh, able in capturing the fact that uh, most of the uh, clot mass was removed and even uh, our simulation was able to capture some fra fragmentation and some fragments left behind. Um, then uh, here is a case where there is a failure both in vitro and in silicon, and you can see with the white thrombus and you can see that uh, there is also a quite good agreement on the location where the thrombus was lost. So now I will show you the case where we had a different outcome in silico, is uh, with the uh, embo trap device and the white thrombus. And um, yeah, as you can see, uh, the kinematic of the procedure was quite well caught and toward, until towards the end, <laughs> where I would say, uh, where the thrombus remains well engaged in our device in silico, while it was lost towards the end of the vessel in vitro. So yes, the outcome was different, but the overall kinematics was in good agreement, I would say. So uh, we were quite um, happy about this, <laughs> this result, this experiment. And so our high fidelity finite element simulation of the procedure was validated with this in-vitro experiment with two color types and three different devices. The limitations here was that the vessel walls was mod were modeled as rigid, but uh, this seemed to be um, acceptable. And also in the brain, the uh, vessels are surrounded by the gray matter and they don't move so much. And then uh, also, this is a structural finite element simulation. There is no fluid flow, but fr also from the agreement between our results and the vitro experiment, it seems that the interactions between the stent and the uh, thrombus prevail over some fluid flow. And also in the clinical operation, usually there is a, a blood flow arrest through a balloon guide catheter. And just to give you this information, we also perform an applicability analysis following the credibility framework uh, in accordance with the ADMI BMB14 that you can, uh, if you are interested, you can see in this uh, publication. So after this validation with in vitro experiments, we went on with uh, a validation with a patient-specific simulation. So 
first of all, we wanted to, in collaboration with the uh, Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, we collected patient imaging uh, and information of the procedure of, for these specific patients. So we acquired CT scans and segmented uh, and obtained the uh, vascular model. Uh, then we uh, had a characterization of the extracted clot in terms of its composition. And uh, we interpolate with some uh, experiments on clot, uh, on ex vivo clot that we had, we interpolated uh, the stress strain curve for the specific composition of these, uh, of these patients. Then we also had information about the length of the thrombus and where it was located, so in the uh, uh, middle cerebral artery. Uh, so then we analyzed together with ne the neurointerventionists that performed the procedure uh, how the procedure went. So we know that this patient uh, received two attempts of the procedure with the Trivo device. Here uh, is the final time memoir. There was no evidence of clot fragmentation. And uh, from the images, you can see, you could see that the, sent the clot was more or less in the same occlusion location after the first attempt. The difference between the first unsuccessful attempt and the second one was the positioning of the stent because it was uh, the neurointervention is helped us <laughs> to identify that the stent positioning was too distant with respect to the occlusion in the first attempt while it was more correctly positioned in the second one. As you see, we included this information in our model, so with a very distal, a distal stent in the first attempt and a correctly positioned in the second one. So this is the simulation of the first attempt. You see here the tracking of the device, the deployment, and now there is the retrieval. And you can see that due to the uh, wrong positioning, the, the clot is not very well engaged and it is lost inside the vas vasculature. While here is the second attempt with the stand correctly positioned. And this time the thrombus is very well integrated into the device and is removed from the, vasculature, uh, from the vascular model. Uh, so, um, with our high fidelity simulation, we were able to correctly reproduce the outcome of this patient-specific procedure, and it also provided insights on the importance of stand positioning for this procedure. The limitation is that we don't have, uh, <laughs> as in the in vitro experiment, we have that very nice video that we could check the whole kinematic. Of course, here we don't have that. Um, and also, uh, the, the, we had to deal with some uncertainties on patient-specific parameters like the friction, uh, the material of the arterial walls. But um, even with this limitation, we were happy about we were we obtained these good uh, results in reproducing this patient-specific case. So after these validation studies, we went on to use this high-fidelity model to conduct some studies on the procedure. And for example, we started by studying the impact of the cerebrovascular anatomy on uh, the outcome of the procedure. As you see, uh, the carotid siphon has a very tortuous anatomy that makes the procedure quite difficult sometimes because the, you have to navigate and retrieve the stand with the clot in this very uh, tortuous shape. So, for this study, uh, always in collaboration with the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, we collected 14 uh, patient-specific cerebrovascular anatomies uh, coming from the Mr. Clean Registry, which is the um, clinical trial that I was talking uh, about at the beginning. So uh, we uh, isolated from the segmentation the three large vessels of interest. And uh, then I created an automatic MATLAB script to perform a geometric characterization of each of these analyses. So I extracted parameters like the, uh, for example, the average diameter of the middle cerebral artery, the angles formed at the T-junction, and then uh, a very detailed characterization of the carotid siphon. So I uh, divided each carotid uh, siphon in four uh, bands. So from the T-junction, there is a superior, then the anterior, posterior, and finally the inferior band. And for each of them, I collected the length, the virtuosity, the diameter in the point of maximum curvature, and also uh, the curvature of the bands, the angles between them, the distances, uh, to try to characterize as much as possible each, of, uh, each anatomy. And so I collected a total of 27 what I called local <laughs> geometric parameters for each uh, cerebrovascular anatomy. So after this, um, 
I uh, decided to play to uh, run the simulation and where the only difference was the vascular anatomy. So I tried to place a clot of the same length of 14 millimeters and composition uh, in the same location, so in the middle of the MCA of each patient. And I ran the uh, thrombectomy simulation with the same device. Uh, so the goal was to uh, uh, see in which uh, simulation I had a positive or negative outcome and trying to find correlations with the, uh, uh, the anatomy parameters. Out of all the 14 simulation, I got nine positive outcomes and five negative outcomes. So I put them here in this, um, in this graph. You see uh, the um, parameters what I call the best stratification index. So uh, two pa uh, geometric parameters. So in the X axis, there is the ratio between the diameter of the thrombus and the diameter of the anterior band, which is the one, uh, let's say, in the middle here highlighted in blue. While on the Y axis, there is the radius of curvature of this same band. So a combination of these two parameters seem to provide uh, a very good characterization of cases with positive and negative outcomes, suggesting that um, the, the com by observing uh, these kinds of parameters, you can uh, make predictions on um, how the probability of having a positive or a negative outcome. So um, this study uh, demonstrated for the first time the impact of the vascular anatomy on uh, the outcome of the thrombectomy in silico, and also the importance to focus on very local geometric parameters rather than on more general uh, parameters that are usually used in the clinics. The limitation is that, of course, this is run on a limited number of patients, and this is valid for the specific uh, type of thrombus and device that I use, but this shows an approach um, of how in, this in silico model can inform um, about what impacts the outcome of the, uh, of the procedure in patients. So this concludes the first part of uh, my work. Uh, and now I will show you how this high fidelity model and also um, a, a type of surrogate model was used to run in silico stroke trials. So first I will show you how I uh, plan an in silico uh, stroke trial proof of concept with this high fidelity simulation. Um, yes, a few words on uh, what is an in silico trial. Um, it is a computer uh, model of four uh, main elements. So first, you need to model the virtual population on which you want to uh, test, uh, for example, a new procedure or a new device. Then you have to, you will model the pathology on set. Here, for example, the present, the formation and the occlusion of the artery. Then you uh, model the treatment, and finally, uh, there is an evaluation of on the outcome of the virtual uh, on the virtual population. So, in silico trials, uh, there is, as you know, a great interest now in developing this technology because it allows to reduce, refine, and par partially replace in vitro experiments, animal tests, and clinical trials. So, reducing the time and costs for launching new uh, compounds into the market, and also ethical aspects related to animal tests and some uh, tests on patients. Um, so currently, uh, the usual clinical trials, only around 10% of them are successful. So uh, also in silico trial can refine um, the studies that are uh, conducted. Um, this part of the work was carried out inside this uh, Horizon uh, 2020 project called INSIST, which had the aim of developing in silico trials for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Um, so now uh, I will uh, present you a demonstration of the use of the high fidelity finite element simulation of the procedure uh, of the thrombectomy procedure for in silico stroke trials. And in my work, I run through two proof of concept trials. One, uh, mm, making a comparison of the performance of two different sent retrievers, and one uh, on the study on the, uh, the performance of a single device uh, with different growth composition. And now I will present you this second uh, application. So uh, this time I created a virtual population 
with uh, 100 patient-specific cerebral vasculature segmentation from the same Mr. Clean registry. As you see here, uh, I received these uh, point clouds with the center line of the vessels, and I uh, created an automatic program to create this um, uh, model of the um, cerebral vasculature of the thrombus and of the catheters. Uh, the, in the, for the 100 uh, patients, I um, randomly assigned to each of them a thrombus, and I uh, assigned to each thrombus a length and a composition um, by fitting uh, the distribution of, uh, of these thrombus characteristics inside the uh, population of patients in the Mr. King trial. So these are just examples of the cerebrovascular anatomy. As you can see, uh, some have very tortuous carotids and very different among them. So for this study, to study the impact of uh, composition on device performance, I perform uh, for each virtual patient, I run two uh, simulations. So with the same device, but uh, once with a um, fibrin-enriched thrombus and the other one at the other time with a uh, red blood cell rich thrombus. And then I compare the outcome uh, of each, uh, for each virtual patient with the two uh, thrombus types. So here are the results of this study. Uh, and the, at the end, I had 91 uh, virtual patients for which I had an admissible simulation outcome with both thrombus types. So of these, 75% of them had a positive outcome with both thrombus types. Uh, about 5% of them had the same negative outcome, but in about 20% of the virtual patients, there was an influence of the thrombus composition. And in the majority of them, so 14% of the patients, the outcome was positive with the soft red blaster rich thrombus and negative with the fibrin plated rich one. So here is an example of one of these cases where you can see that uh, when there is a red thrombus, it is well integrated in the device and it is removed from the vasculature, while the white thrombus uh, is lost inside. And here are some snapshots of the simulation. As you can see, since the beginning, the red one is really inside the cage of the stent, while the uh, white one, which is um, more um, is a stiffer, is left outside and is not very well integrated. And in the end, the procedure is a uh, phase. And this is the behavior of 14% of the virtual patient. And this is something also observed in the clinics. Um, so the conclusion of this study is, uh, it was a proof of concept uh, of how uh, an in silico stroke trial would look like with this high fidelity uh, thrombectomy simulation. And the advantage also of in silico trial is that, is that it allows a comparison uh, on the same virtual patient, something that of course is not possible in clinical trials. The limitation here is that I always assume an optimal stand positioning that explains the high success rate in general. And also this is very computationally expensive because if, uh, it is about 40 hours per simulation. And so uh, with this approach, you can evaluate a limited virtual population. For this reason, I developed a different type of modeling. So uh, I developed a thrombectomy surrogate models for larger in silico trials. So a surrogate model is a uh, computationally inexpensive model that tries to replicate the input-output relationship of a high-fidelity model. So uh, here, uh, the high-fidelity, of course, is the uh, finite element from Bactomy stimulation. I collected a data set of uh, many <laughs> uh, of these simulations, and I trained a surrogate model to learn um, the relationship between a set of input that then I will uh, specify and the outcome of the procedure. In this case, I chose a binary outcome, so success, yes or no, of the procedure. So I built a classification model. The advantage, of course, is that uh, it gives nearly instantaneous prediction uh, with respect to uh, the affidavity simulation. So the aim here is to develop this surrogate model and to integrate it in a platform for in silico stroke trials on large virtual populations. As I said, the training data set is made of high fidelity finite element simulation of the thrombectomy, and I had 186 with one device and 94 with another device. And so I built two separate uh, surrogate models, for one for each device. I chose, as I said, the logistic regression 
binary algorithm for performing binary classification. And the output of interest was the successful or unsuccessful recanalization. The input parameters for the prediction after a sensitivity analysis were the through, uh, two uh, thrombus parameters, so the length and the composition, uh, and six vascular anatomy parameters. So uh, this is um, an overview of the platform for in silico trials that was developed within the INSEEDS project by our colleagues at the Amsterdam University. So um, it starts with the creation of the virtual population. Then there is integrated a model of the baseline patient with its, uh, his or her arterial blood flow and the perfusion of the vascular tissues. Then there is a modeling of the stroke concept with the placement of the occlusion. And then this platform can, there are models to study the arterial blood flow with the occlusion and the state of the perfusion. Then there is the uh, model of the treatment, so the thrombectomy surrogate model. And the arterial blood flow and the perfusion are evaluated after the treatment to derive the patient outcome and the population outcome of the in silico trial. So, here I will focus only on the first part, so uh, the generation of the virtual population, the placing of the clot, the treatment with the uh, thrombectomy surrogate model, and the outcome here is the recanalization, so not the perfusion. So the steps of the silico trial are the generation of 500 virtual patients in each trial using this a statistical model. For each virtual patient, I determine the eight thrombus and vascular parameters. Some derived directly from the virtual population, others randomly sampled because unfortunately some of the vascular anatomy parameters were not collected in the original uh, Mr. Clean trial. So we had to randomly sample some of them. Um, so for each virtual uh, patient, the surrogate thrombectomy model was interrogated to and the recanalization status was predicted. And finally, the patient recanalization outcomes were collected to determine the success rate of, in the population. With this procedure, I ran three proofs of concept in silico trials, one called validation trial, a thrombus composition trial, and a device comparison trial. The validation trial aimed to uh, compare the results of the in silico trial with the Mr. Clean clinical trial that I mentioned before by selecting um, the same inclusion criteria uh, in accordance with our simulation. So clot placed in the M1 patients that had an occlusion in uh, the middle of the MCA and treated with the device A. And here you can see that the uh, recanalization success rate of our in silico trial is within the confidence is similar to the one in the Mr. King trial and within the confidence interval. So this is uh, this was an encouraging result, and we went on with uh, uh, the thrombus composition trial, aiming at uh, comparing the performance of device A with uh, uh, in patients with. Uh, thrombus with high or low fibrin content. And here we obtain uh, that the two population, in the two population there was a significantly statistical, statistically significant a different recanalization success rate, so uh, higher with the softer thrombi. Uh, finally, we run the device comparison trial comparing the performance of these two devices. And also in this case, we obtain a statistically significant uh, different uh, recanalization success rate uh, with, uh, uh, for example, device B. In this case, device B was uh, performing better than device A. So with this study, uh, we created, successfully created this surrogate model that allowed to uh, run uh, in silico trials on large virtual population with the validation trial demonstrating a good accuracy of the surrogate model and also the possibility of evaluating the treatment efficacy in, on specific subpopulation. The limitation is that, of course, the surrogate model implies a loss of accuracy with respect to the high fidelity model, but uh, this can be considered accept acceptable if you want to have population level results rather than patient specific results. Um, so finally, uh, I will go to the last part of my presentation, where uh, I, uh, we develop a surrogate thrombectomy model, this time to support preoperative planning. So this time we needed uh, a model with uh, patient level accuracy and not just population level. 
Uh, this work was carried out during my research stay at the Università Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona. So the aim, as I said, is to develop this surrogate model with patient level accuracy for fast estimation of recanalization success to support preparative planning. The training data is uh, a set of 94 simulations with the TRIVO device. Of these 94, I, I had, uh, this was were the high uh, fidelity simulations, so 81 samples with a positive outcome and 13 with an unsuccessful outcome. So this is the training data set of high fidelity simulation that we use to be trained to train the uh, the um, so sorry the predictive model. So um, I started with the definition of the input data for the predictive model. So I wanted to give a parameterization of the vascular anatomy this time without choosing in advance the specific parameters I want to give it as input, but I use the level set technique to take into account the whole anatomy, the whole patient-specific anatomy. The level set consists in defining a box that can contain all the vascular anatomy, which are previously aligned among them, and then to uh, define the geometry by calculating uh, the distance, so this uh, box is meshed with a, a resolution defined with the sensitivity analysis, and you calculate the distance from each point of this box to the surface of the vascular anatomy. And in this, in this way, you obtain a representation of the anatomy of your uh, patient-specific Bessel model. Uh, this is, of course, a, a very big uh, matrix of about 80,000 uh, values of distances. And so I perform, I applied a dimensionality reduction with a kernel principal component analysis, which means a nonlinear principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality of this information. Uh, so this uh, gives a parameterization of the anatomy to which I added then the two uh, thrombus properties, so the length and the composition. And in this way, I define for each uh, virtual patient a vector, a set of input parameters. So this is a schematic representation of what I just said. So starting from the complex anatomy on the left, the physical space, we apply this force dimensionality reduction and we land in the reduced training set space. So now what we, I want to do is to apply a second kernel principal component analysis but with a particular technique so uh, called kernel optimization such that when i apply this function to project to uh, a new feature space um, this function is able to clusterize to separate cases with a positive or negative outcome of the thrombectomy procedure so uh, how this kernel training works um, uh, here is the mathematical uh, equation, but what they mean, it, it is an optimization problem where the objective of the optimization, the objective function is to, means to maximize the distance between samples, but with a constraint called local isometry constraint applied only to samples that I know belong to the same class. I know it because it's the training data set. Okay, so this uh, allows to project, when you apply this uh, opti uh, optimized kernel function, you can separate the samples based uh, on, their, uh, on the successful outcome or not. So going back to this representation, uh, this is for the uh, training of the model. And once you have a new test sample, you start with the whole uh, anatomy and you apply the first KPCA to reduce the dimensionality and parameterize the anatomy. Then with this set of input parameters, you use the optimized kernel function to project this sample and it will land in one of the two clusters. And in this way, you can predict the outcome of the procedure. So here are the results um, of the clusterization of the samples. I used 70% uh, uh, of my samples for training and 30% for testing, and I performed a tenfold cross-validation. So this is uh, an example of one of the 10 repetition. And you can see that in all the 10 cases, uh, you can see that I obtained a very good clusterization result. It was the function was able to separate uh, cases with positive uh, the yellow ones, positive outcome and negative outcome, the blue dots. So then the classification of new cases. Uh, here you see how they are in the original space, all mixed together. And in the feature space, here you see uh, the squares are the test cases. 
and um, the colors I gave is based on the high fidelity simulation, so the known uh, results. And you can see that in this case, we had two false negatives and one false positive. Uh, the average result from the 10 uh, tenfold cross validation was that I had in, uh, an average of 80% of correct predictions, around 10% of false negatives, and 7% of false positives. These are encouraging results. However, these are limited by the small uh, training and testing test that I had. So, in particular, of the testing samples, due to the fact that very few cases had a negative outcome, I had for example, only four unsuccessful cases to test. So when you uh, consider the uh, per percentage of false positives against this number, this goes up to 50%. So there is still room for improvement, in particular by enlarging very much the <laughs> training data set, which, uh, as you can imagine, is also computationally expensive because um, you have to run many uh, high fidelity simulations. So to conclude, this, uh, uh, this study uh, was focused on the uh, creation of ad hoc methodologies for prediction of thermectomy outcomes and combined level set and optimized kernel principal component analysis techniques. It provided good, very good uh, clusterization results and encouraging good classification results of test samples. And uh, it uh, is the first attempt towards real-time prediction based on patient-specific data for preoperative planning. And as I said, the limitation is that uh, there is a limited and, and very unbalanced data set. And in the future, uh, also different kernel functions may be uh, considered. So to conclude, um, in my PhD thesis, I developed in silico models of the thrombectomy procedure with stent retriever. First, I developed an high fidelity model, and it was validated with in vitro experiment with a first patient specific case. And it was used to conduct a first study on the impact of vascular anatomy on the procedure outcome. Then um, I used the high fidelity model to run the proof of concept in silico stroke trials. And uh, it was used to evaluate the outcomes in different subpopulations and the performance of different devices. Then I also demonstrated how a surrogate thrombectomy model can be built and used uh, to run uh, in silico trials on large virtual populations. And finally, I also tried to develop a surrogate, a different type of surrogate thrombectomy model with a patient level accuracy to support uh, preoperative planning, and which is a tool that can uh, better inform and uh, support the clinical decision making of the neuro interventionalist to uh, improve the first pass uh, recanalization rate in uh, stroke patients. Uh, so with this, I thank you for the attention, and I want to thank my PhD supervisor, Professor Francesco Migliavacca and Giulia Luraghi, and here and also all the partners in the ANSYS project, of course. And uh, here below, you can see my contacts, my email and LinkedIn account, and please, uh, if you have any questions now or later, uh, get in contact. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, for your great presentation. Super interesting. I have some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Benedict is asking you, uh, she said, congrats for this very interesting study. And she said, she asked if you think that stand with different composition should be used in, should be used according to the type of thrombus, red versus white clot. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the question. Anna, sorry, can you repeat? Oh, uh, stents of different composition? Should be used according to the type of the thrombus okay. composition. I, okay, I think uh, the question is um, on the different like uh, shape and different design of the stent structure, I suppose. And yes, this is a, a very on-point question and is actually what companies are doing. Uh, they are proposing some uh, device design are more indicated for uh, a specific type of thrombus rather than another one. So I didn't show the results here, but in our uh, device comparison in silico trial, uh, we, for example, we found out that the device B and the one with the double cage design was better 
in integrating and uh, keeping inside the device the stiff uh, um, thrombi, the white ones. So yes, absolutely. Uh, a lot of research is now dedicated to tailoring the, the procedure and the device to specific patients, for example, based, of course, on the thrombocyte. Um, a problem here, however, is that uh, it's not always possible to know beforehand, before the procedure, the composition of the thrombus. There is now uh, much research going on, uh, trying to correlate some imaging characteristics like the gray level or some also more complex uh, characteristics to uh, the composition. Uh, but it's, it is still not always possible and there is uh, quite a lot of uncertainty related to this parameter before the, the procedure. Okay. Uh, in the meanwhile, maybe waiting for other questions, I would like to ask you uh, on the importance of using uh, a validated model for running uh, in silico trials and, and developing surrogate models. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course, uh, as the UPH community knows <laughs> very well this, uh, this, uh, this aspect. So uh, the validation is uh, very important, especially when you want to uh, really apply uh, your model to clinical context or preclinical um, applications. So, uh, if you, uh, of course there are, you know, there is this uh, uh, BMB40 standard that uh, proposes a risk-based approach for the evidence you must provide. So, of course, if you're, uh, if the life of the patient depends on your model, it must be very well validated and uh, its credibility in that specific context of use must be proven. And um, yeah, there are, we try to, to perform, as I said, this uh, credibility assessment as a, mainly as an exercise for now, but it is very important to show uh, how your model, uh, uh, so first of all, you have to validate it with in vitro experiments, with patient specific cases when possible, with uh, clinical trials, and then you have to very well define the context of use of your model. You have to make very clear what answer your model can answer, what a question your model can answer, and how it should be used within what range of parameters. And so, yes, that is a fundamental, it's a fundamental step. And okay. also, sorry, uh, no, I didn't want to. Sorry, I believe you finished the the answer, but I didn't yeah. want didn't meant to interrupt you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. I think we have no other questions. Okay, a new one is right. I, okay, other lot of questions. Okay. The first one from Luca. He said that thanks, Sara, for the nice presentation. What would be the next step for implementing the patient level accuracy of the in silico trials? Only nonlinear kernel function implementation, or are there other approaches? Um, yeah, uh, there are yeah a lot of approaches. So first of all, the the, the uh, yeah the nonlinear kernel function, for example, is was an idea, but the first thing I would go to is to enlarge the training data set. That's the fundamental uh, thing. Maybe even that model that I developed in my PhD would perform much better if I had a much larger <laughs> training data set, that's for sure. Um, then, yes, there are other strategies. This is about the, um, also thinking of a completely different approach, I don't know, like um, that worked better with unbalanced data sets because Luckily, there are more positive than negative cases, <laughs> so you will probably always have this kind of imbalance in your uh, in your model. So other approaches that can take into account these uh, unbalanced data set may be may be useful. Uh, and other uh, so here I wanted to so this is kind of. Mm, I don't want to enter into this uh, thing, but it's kind of machine learning, that kind of approaches, right? Uh, so exploring other, the, and really leveraging these uh, machine learning approaches is, uh, could be a good idea. Here I wanted, as a first uh, guess, I wanted to use a quite uh, controlled model that in the end I knew what it was doing, but maybe some other approaches can be explored. 
again, also with the, <laughs> we were talking about validation, it's always tricky when you want to use this kind of approaches in a biomedical application, but it's worth to, to try that. Yeah, these are my ideas right now. <laughs> so there are many options to, to, to build this kind of model. Thanks. And then Marta asked, uh, thank you for the presentation. And then she asked, uh, how would you improve your high fidelity in silico models? Um, yeah, uh, there are uh, a lot, of, as I said, a lot of um, limitation or modeling assumptions that we made. Uh, the one about the rigid vessel walls, for example. And I know, uh, so as Anna said, now I uh, move to another um, research, I, I changed job, let's say, but I know my colleagues in labs are continuing with this, uh, with this work and uh, are currently uh, overcoming some of the limitation of this work. So I know they already integrated these uh, deformable vessel walls and uh, they will study, uh, we started already with my PhD, we started to compare the results and it doesn't seem to affect too much. But of course, if you want to be more realistic, you may also introduce uh, the formable uh, walls. Then, um, in this, uh, throughout all this presentation, I use structural finite element simulation. So uh, we neglected the uh, fluid flow, the blood flow. As I said, uh, usually in the clinical procedure, there is uh, some blood arrest, so with the balloon, uh, but still there is some blood flowing. And if you want to be more um, adherent to the reality, you may also take into account uh, and perform, for example, some fluid structure interaction. However, you have always to consider uh, if it is worth it because the computational uh, effort would uh, be very higher. And also you will introduce a lot of uncertainties related to uh, how much flow comes from smaller vessels to, to the uh, occlusion and parameters like that. So uh, some this kind of studies, will help to know how, where there is room for improvement of the model. Um, then uh, a lot of improving can be associated with the modeling of the properties of the thrombus. This is also something that I know my former colleagues are very uh, uh, now um, engaged in doing uh, to uh, improve the, the characterization and the modeling of the material properties of the thrombus its fragmentation modality, um, the friction, studies on the friction between the uh, clot and the arterial wall. These are the parameters where I will look into to improve the high fidelity model. Great. And on this, uh, Eduardo asked, uh, how did you handle the fragmentation of the clot in the simulation? Yeah. Uh, so, um, Right now, uh, it was what I showed here. It was a, a failure mode of the um, elements of, that made the radar elements that made the thrombus. So uh, with a, a threshold on the uh, stress. So when the stress um, was higher than some threshold in that element, that element was kind of removed from the from the uh, model, and so that's you see that there are fragments so parts where there are no more connection there is a fragment um, and this the thresh the stress threshold was calibrated with uh, always with this uh, in vitro experiments in uh, tensile tests on clot analogs and this, okay, this is great that function in a design the last question uh, benedict asked uh, that you can use the model and the response should be compatible with the medical routine. So how, how quickly do you think the answer can be given? Yeah, uh, it must be very quick. That's why we went to the, uh, you can, for stroke, for other application, as you all know, uh, like for uh, valvular procedures, uh, you can use the high fidelity model to plan the procedure. For stroke, you cannot, because you cannot wait for the computational time required to handle this very complex simulation. That's why we went for uh, surrogate modeling approaches. And for stroke treatment, the less time uh, you, so the preparative planning must be done as quick as possible. Usually uh, the patients as soon as arrived in the, in the clinic, is, uh, the procedure is done. So ideally, your procedure must, your uh, sorry, your model must run 
almost instantaneously. So I envision something like um, from the images that are currently routinely acquired, some CT CT scans, you, there must be something that automatically is able to segment it and find the, the vascular model, which is already possible. Um, our colleagues in Amsterdam did, uh, did that, for example, inside the INSIS project. And from there, uh, you should also, from the imaging, ideally, you should have an idea, an estimation on the clock type. Of course, the location that you already know from the images, but the clock type, how, if it's stiff or not. And you should integrate this information in this surrogate model that can provide an instantaneous estimate. And also, uh, the, so here I created a model with one device. Of course, the idea is to have surrogate models with all or at least the most common devices and have estimations of the probability of success for each device and each type of procedure. But this is uh, once you have this trained model, this is not a problem. Uh, it is instantaneous. The tricky part would be to have this streamline of automatic operations from the imaging of the patient and in few seconds go having the input parameters you need to interrogate the model. And then the scenario interventionist, which of course always has the final decision, but can have a support with your model with the probability of success of each uh, procedure, um, a better idea on which procedure to perform. Okay, great. I think we have reached the uh, the time. And thank you, Sarah, for uh, your presentation. And thank, thank you all for attending this webinar. See you the next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.